Production funding for the Alaska Highway is made possible by the Alaska Division of Tourism. Westmark Hotels, offering lodging, dining, and northern hospitality throughout Alaska and the Yukon. Gray Line of Alaska. The Anchorage Times, locally owned and operated since 1915. Called the longest main street in the world, the Alaska Highway runs from Dawson Creek, British Columbia, 1,422 miles to Delta Junction, Alaska. A journey that once took months now takes only days. Yet even today, 50 years after it was first opened, Travelers driving this road still find a sense of adventure. As a person drives north, there's a feeling of excitement adventuring along the same trail that trappers and gold seekers used over 100 years ago heading for Dawson Creek, Whitehorse, and Fairbanks. In 1899, E.H. Harriman, the railroad magnate, proposed building a railroad from Chicago to the Bering Sea, connecting the Alaska and Canadian gold fields with the continental United States. When the claims played out, the gold seekers left, and the idea of building a railroad became just another memory of the gold rush. Plans to construct a road through Canada to Alaska surfaced in the early 1920s. Donald MacDonald, a locating engineer for the Alaska Road Commission, had dreamed for years of an overland coastal route to Alaska. It would run north from Seattle across British Columbia through the Yukon Territory to Fairbanks. MacDonald and a group of Fairbanks residents formed the International Highway Association to sponsor the building of a road to the continental United States. Citizens of Canada and the United States lobbied for years to begin construction. But political, territorial, and economic factors kept the great project stalled. In 1933, Donald MacDonald and the Automobile Highway Association, trying to draw attention to his proposed route to the States, helped finance an Alaska prospector and trapper, Slim Williams, to make a trip over McDonald's coastal route by dog sled. Using primitive maps drawn by McDonald, Slim traveled from Fairbanks to Seattle in five and a half months. In Seattle, Slim replaced his sled runners with wheels and outfitted his dog team with leather moccasins. He then headed east mushing 2,000 miles to the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. Slim was a big attraction at the fair. People from across the country came to see the man who had mushed a dog team from Alaska to Chicago. After the fair closed for the season, Slim mushed on to Washington, D.C. to tell Alaska's representative to Congress, Anthony Diamond, about the possibilities of a road between Alaska and the United States. Slim was invited to the White House to brief President Roosevelt on the proposed road. Years later, Mrs. Roosevelt would remember Slim as the most vocal Alaska advocate for the International Highway. Late in 1933, President Roosevelt was authorized by Congress to set up a joint commission with the Canadian government to determine the feasibility of a road to Alaska. After many meetings, the commission determined a highway was feasible from an engineering viewpoint, but expressed concern of its practical usefulness. Representative Diamond, again voicing a need for the road, introduced a bill in Congress for a highway, but could not find any support. As the years passed, pressure continued for a highway in the Northwest, prompting President Roosevelt in 1938 to appoint the Alaska International Highway Commission to make yet another study. 
This new commission also submitted a favorable report and even undertook a survey of several possible routes. The commission would end up suggesting three routes. Donald McDonald's Coastal Route, Route A, starting in Prince George, going north to Hazleton and Telegraph Creek, crossing the Yukon by way of Whitehorse, and reaching Fairbanks by the Tanana Valley. Route B, which also started in Prince George, followed the Rocky Mountain Trench up the Parsnip and Finlay Rivers to Finlay Forks and Sighton Pass. Then turned north to Dawson City, down the Yukon, then connecting to Fairbanks. But once again, plans for the highway were tabled due to high construction costs and the uncertainty of what effect the intrusion of the United States government into northern Canada would have on the territories. On May 14, 1939, in another attempt to focus attention on the proposed highway, Adventurers Slim Williams and John Logan and their dog Blizzard left Fairbanks for Seattle. They traveled by motorcycle over the coastal route that McDonald had advocated for years, and the same route Williams had used to mush his dog team out in 1933. Slim and John, using maps provided by McDonald, followed pack trails for easier going, pushing their motorcycles across half-thawed muskeg on fallen logs, and ferried their motorcycles across rivers on canvas boats and wooden rafts. Blazing their own trail part of the way, the two traveled 2,300 miles in six and a half months. Slim said he and John never missed a meal, just got several days behind sometimes. Arriving in Seattle in early December, they were introduced at a Chamber of Commerce meeting as the first men to motor the proposed Alaska-Yukon International Highway to Seattle. Early in 1939, with the rumble of war sounding in Europe, a string of air bases extending from Edmonton, Alberta to Fairbanks, Alaska was proposed. The Canadian Department of Transport wanted to develop the bases to move people and supplies to Western Canada and Alaska. Hitler's invasion of Europe in the fall of France in 1940 alarmed the governments of Canada and the USA. The defense of Canada and Alaska became an issue of paramount importance. The go-ahead was given for construction of more than 20 airfields and emergency landing strips that would become the Northwest Staging Route. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, the threat of invasion on Alaska and Canada became a reality. There was no certainty that the shipping lanes to Alaska could be kept open. Both the U.S. and Canada realized the military need for an overland supply line secure from enemy attack. In the interest of their mutual defense, the two countries finally agreed to build a highway across Canada. Canada agreed to provide the right-of-way, waive import duties and taxes, and allow the use of timber, gravel, fill, and rock for construction along the route of the highway. 
The United States agreed to pay for the construction and to maintain the highway for the duration of the war, turning over the Canadian portion of the road to the Canadian government six months after the war ended. A Canadian official said, we will supply the soil, the United States will provide the money and toil. A highway would be built to Alaska. With the signing of the agreement, an American cabinet committee consisting of the secretaries of Navy, War, and Interior was assigned by President Roosevelt the difficult task of route selection. They met and then transferred route selection to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Military considerations were recognized as the most important factor in choosing what path the highway would take. The Corps decided the road would follow the line of the Northwest Staging Route airfields. This route not only furnished a visual guide for the pilots, but would help supply the airfields and flight strips with fuel and materials. The Corps requested permission from Canada to conduct a survey and construct a pioneer road. Plans called for a rough working road, which would be, in part, the site of a permanent road. Work would begin at Dawson Creek, British Columbia, and extend northwestward to Big Delta, Alaska, just 98 miles east of Fairbanks. U.S. Army Corps of Engineer troops would survey and construct a rough military road usable by all-terrain vehicles that would connect the airfields. Civilian contractors directed by the U.S. Public Roads Administration would then utilize the Pioneer Road in the location and construction of a permanent road. Brigadier General C.L. Sturdivant, Assistant Chief of Engineers, was ordered to obtain survey reports and determine the availability of road building equipment. Colonel, soon to be Brigadier General, Bill Hoag was appointed director of the project. His orders from General Sturdivant were to push the Pioneer Road to completion with all speed within the physical capacity of the troops. Hogue did a preliminary aerial reconnaissance of the route and found that the few maps that did exist were largely inadequate. He flew over great stretches of unmapped wilderness searching for a route that would connect the airfields together. Hogue discovered that existing access to the project was limited to three major routes. By rail to Dawson Creek, British Columbia, by boat to Skagway, Alaska, and then rail to Whitehorse, Yukon, by boat to Valdez, Alaska, and from there by highway to Gulcana, Alaska. Little did the towns realize the impact the construction of the road would soon have on their communities. Speed was of the essence. Top priority was given to cutting a passable trail through the short working season. The northern climate dictated a construction period of six months or less. Hoag had to move men, heavy equipment, and supplies across the Peace River to Fort Nelson. This task had to be accomplished while the river ice could still support heavy traffic. The spring thaw would make the winter road out of Dawson Creek a sloppy mire that could swallow both man and machine. Orders went out and men and equipment of the 18th and 35th combat regiments began moving north. They came from all over, men and boys, officers and enlisted, black and white, from Iowa, Georgia, South Dakota, New York, California, and Florida, heading north by air, boat, and rail, most of them not knowing their final destination. Most of the men had never seen or used the heavy equipment that they would very shortly be operating. They would learn by doing. Soldiers from New York, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles soon would become skilled woodsmen with their axes. They would work in a land where summer was three months of daylight and where temperatures would rise to 70 degrees and sometimes much higher. In winter, there were months of darkness and prolonged periods of sub-zero weather. 
when temperatures sometimes dropped lower than 50 below zero. They would learn about the cold, ice and snow. They would also learn to live in an environment that offered continuous daylight, to have mud or dust mixed in with every meal, and to sleep with flies and mosquitoes that were always on the attack. Some would grow to hate the country. Some would love it. On March 19, 1942, two days after General Douglas MacArthur became Supreme Allied Commander in the Pacific, and still several weeks before the fall of Corregidor, the men of the 35th Engineers arrived in Dawson Creek, unloaded their heavy equipment, and began driving north overland in minus 35 degree weather to Fort Nelson, British Columbia. Their trek of 325 miles would last 25 days in some of the worst weather the men had ever experienced. Crossing the Peace River, the 35th Engineers laid planks and sawdust over the ice to form a bridge and drove across to Fort St. John. They then pushed ahead 265 miles over frozen muskeg to Fort Nelson. Arriving in Fort Nelson on April 5th, the men of the 35th had beaten the spring thaw and were ready to start the road westward to Watson Lake. At the same time the Alaska Highway was beginning, plans for a second major building effort in Northwest Canada were being finalized in Washington and Ottawa. The Canadian Oil Pipeline Project, Canal, called for construction of an oil pipeline and road running 577 miles from Norman Wells Northwest Territory, southwest across the McKinsey Mountain Range, to connect with a refinery being constructed in Whitehorse. This project would provide gas and diesel fuel for trucks using the highway, and aviation gas for the fighter planes, bombers, and transports flying the Northwest staging route. The oil pipeline would take two years to build and employ the labor of over 14,000 engineers and civilians. As plans for the oil pipeline were beginning, an army of road builders began moving into position to start on the highway. In early April, the 18th Combat Engineers landed at Skagway and took the White Pass and Yukon Narrow Gauge Railroad 111 miles to Whitehorse. From there, they began working on a trail westward to Klawani Lake. Skagway and the White Pass and Yukon Railroad would become a major port and supply route for troops and materials used on the construction of the Alaska Highway and the Canal Project. In mid-April, the 93rd General Service Regiment and 340th General Service Regiment, consisting of black enlisted men and white officers, arrived in Skagway. They landed without their heavy equipment, and would remain in Skagway from mid-April to mid-May, awaiting their trucks, tractors, and graders. The 340th was moved by rail to Whitehorse and divided, part working west, the remainder assigned to work south toward Watson Lake. The 93rd was sent to Carcross and worked east to Teslin Lake. In late April 1942, Lieutenant General Eugene Raybold, Chief of Engineers, split the project into two independent commands, placing Colonel Patsy O'Connor in charge of the Fort St. John or Southern Sector, and General Hogue in charge of the Whitehorse or Northern Sector. Watson Lake was the dividing point. The 95th and 341st General Service Regiments unloaded in Dawson Creek and were sent to Fort St. John to build the road north to Fort Nelson. <laughs> 
As construction began, survey crews were laying out the route for the Pioneer Road. Bush pilots spent long hours flying aerial reconnaissance, taking Army and Public Roads Administration engineers up to check the terrain. Possible routes were photographed to find the best location for the new road. Aerial surveys were followed by ground reconnaissance on foot with pack horse and dog sled. Canadians played an important part in the surveying and mapping of the highway. Locals hired on as guides, leading locating teams and advising as to the best possible route, scouting the country for solid ground and good stream crossings. Some stretches of the route followed old Indian and trapper trails. The primary road was cut with axes and bulldozers through forests of spruce, jack pine, and aspen trees. Sometimes when a clearing crew didn't have a surveyor, they would send a man out with an ax in the general direction of their objective, with the bulldozers following along behind. Some locators expressed fears of being run over by the heavy equipment as the tractors kept pushing forward. While the road was being built, one soldier was asked what he thought about this part of the world. He said, this country ain't nothing but miles and miles of nothing but miles and miles. Living conditions were very difficult for the thousands of men building the road. It was impossible to make the camps comfortable, since they had to be moved every few days to keep up with the road building. Camps at the head end of the Pioneer Road were primitive, framed tents with field kitchens housed under canvas. The GI stove never reached some outfits, so they used open fires and oil barrel ovens. Most laundry was done the old-fashioned way, hand rubbed in rivers, lakes, and streams. The 97th General Service Regiment landed at Valdez in mid-May and began working out of Slana in mid-June, northeastward towards the Tanana River. By early June 1942, two combat regiments and five general service regiments with over 10,000 officers and men had arrived to work on the road. The Japanese attack on Dutch Harbor and the seizure of Attu and Kiska Islands in the western Aleutians made construction of the road even more urgent. The fight for Alaska had begun. It was a race of men and machines against the vast wilderness of Canada and Alaska, against time and the enemy. As the Army was issuing marching orders and moving troops into place, the Public Roads Administration, the PRA, started gathering engineers and support personnel from district offices across the United States. Civilians would also play a major part in the construction of the military highway. The PRA would act as overseer on the project, contracting with and supervising the civilians working to widen and straighten the Pioneer Road or to relocate the road on a new alignment to be established by Public Roads Administration engineers. The PRA first selected five management construction companies, who then hired smaller individual Canadian and American companies with their men and equipment on cost-plus fixed-fee contracts with the U.S. government. The highway was divided into portions for various contractors, depending on their size and skills. A call went out for shovel operators, cat skinners, welders, pile drivers, laborers, and cooks. The contractors were hiring men and gathering trucks, tools, and other equipment and materials needed to build the permanent all-weather road. Working conditions were severe. Warning signs were posted in the contractors' recruiting offices, giving the men some idea of what they would be up against. 
Base camps were built at 25 mile intervals, with each contractor usually working in both directions to meet the other contractors halfway. By May of 1942, the PRA had hired 54 construction companies, including 13 Canadian firms, engaging over 6,000 civilians to help build the road. Vast amounts of equipment and supplies had to be shipped north to keep the construction moving. Supplies by the rail car load began arriving at the Dawson Creek Railhead. Surplus equipment from camps of the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Project Administration were located and shipped north for use by the Public Roads Administration. During one five-week period, over 600 boxcars filled with equipment occupied every space in Dawson Creek. The big question during the late summer and fall of 1942 was whether the road could be pushed through before winter halted all operations. In July, the Army realized that if the access road was going to be finished on schedule, the engineer troops and civilians would have to join forces. General Hoag requested assistance for the engineer regiments. The PRA and civilian contractors were ordered to leave their work on the permanent highway to help finish the Pioneer Road. Contractors were shifted up and down the line to supplement and speed up construction. Some contractors were put onto the Pioneer Road to shape it up, gravel the surface, and improve the alignment and grade, while others were put to work on uncompleted sections. It would become a combined effort with overlapping work responsibilities. As various regiments completed their sections of the road, they fell back and improved their original efforts. It was a race of men and machines against the coming winter. The many streams and rivers along the route posed major problems in the construction of the road. By the time it was completed, over 130 bridges would be built. Some streams could be forded, others required pontoon bridges. At wider waterways, troops made rafts by lashing pontoons together and decking them with timber, powering them with outboard motors. The 74th Light Pontoon Company hauled men and supplies across the Peace River at Fort St. John on the tug Alcan. Tugs and barges also moved men and supplies back and forth on the Teslin River and on Teslin and Tagish Lakes. Nothing was allowed to hold up construction. If a truck or cat broke down and was holding up progress, it was pushed over the side. Build the road was the motto. During the first months of construction, a spirit of cooperation developed among all workers on the job, military and civilian alike. Work, work, and more work was the schedule, seven days a week. Sometimes four or five miles of road could be built in a day, as the summer daylight hours allowed the crews to work around the clock. During July and August, in 90 degree heat, the men were forced to wear gloves and old style hats with netting to protect themselves against swarms of mosquitoes, flies, and the legendary no see -ums. Despite long hours and tough going, the men kept a sense of humor. Humor was everywhere. There were signs all along the road recalling memories of towns far away. There was a story passed up and down the road about two mosquitoes in a tent who were discussing the merits of two sleeping soldiers. One said, let's not eat them here, let's drag them outside. Oh no, the other replied, if we do, the big fellows will get them. 
Sergeant Harold Hubbard's cartoons of Army life brought smiles and laughter to the men. If you can laugh at yourself, things don't seem so bad. Entertainment took various forms, including cribbage, poker, horseshoes, baseball, photography, and watching the numerous bears that became attached to the garbage dumps. A large sign was posted outside some of the construction campsites that read, Warning, if you are being chased by a bear, don't run into camp. Men adopted pets such as huskies, squirrels, and bear cubs. Some former city boys became expert fishermen on the hundreds of lakes and streams along the route. The men working on the highway dubbed the road the oil can highway because of the hundreds of empty gas and diesel fuel drums scattered along the road. A lack of spare parts and the difficulty in making repairs were problems faced by both the army and the civilian contractors. Due to the great shortage of spare parts, it was necessary to cannibalize some machines in order to keep others serviceable. Repair shops on wheels kept equipment in service. Portable refueling and greasing units kept the machines online and crews working. On September 24th, bulldozers of the 340th Regiment cutting a trail south from Whitehorse and bulldozers of the 35th Regiment heading north met at Contact Creek, about 50 miles east of Watson Lake closing the road on the southern sector. On October 25th, lead bulldozers of the 18th and 97th engineers met at Beaver Creek, a few miles east of the Alaska-Canada border. The two units had joined their sections by means of a winter road, which would be passable until spring breakup. The Alaska Highway was officially dedicated at Soldier Summit overlooking Kluwani Lake on November 20th, 1942. It was 30 degrees below zero and the men had a tough time keeping warm. I desire to express the admiration of the government of Canada to uh, the American Corps of Engineers for one of the greatest engineering marvels in the whole world. Carry on that splendid work. This road is built for war, but this road will be used when peace and victory come back to us again. This road will again be used for the great purposes of reconstruction and of peace. They've cut the ribbon. The Alaska-Canada Highway is now officially open. Eight months after construction began, the Honorable Ian McKenzie of Canada and E.L. Bartlett, acting governor of Alaska, cut the ribbon and trucks moved northward over the 1,600-mile highway. The objective of getting a road into Alaska that winter had been achieved. 
that the highway had exacted its toll of human life. A pontoon ferry crossing Charlie Lake near Fort St. John capsized in a sudden squall, drowning two officers and 10 men. Eight soldiers were drowned crossing the Peace River. One death from exposure occurred when a driver tried to walk 10 miles to camp instead of waiting for help in his disabled truck. Workers lost their lives when trucks and jeeps overturned on muddy inclines. All the drivers talked about one steep and treacherous spot at mile 108 called Suicide Hill. Several fatal accidents occurred there before it was finally leveled out. Services were held and lost comrades remembered. Work continued on into the winter under extreme weather conditions. Temperatures reached 72 degrees below zero on the northern sector. At sub-zero temperatures, diesel fuel solidified and gasoline lines froze. Drivers kept engines running continuously or risked having their trucks freeze up. Throughout the winter, convoys used the road to carry supplies to the camps and the airports. Sometimes punishment becomes a pleasure. For a time, any driver who slid off the road got five days KP. Since most of the truck cabs weren't heated, a lot of drivers started sliding into the ditch just to spend time in a warm mess hall. A new order was issued stating that the first order of business was for the driver to get his truck out of the ditch. Maybe then he would be allowed the honor of KP. Many trucks and tractors dropped through the ice, becoming trapped by the freezing water. They were left as a ghostly memory of what happens when you break down. After the breakthrough, there was still a lot of work left to make the truck trail into a usable road. During the winter of 1942, the Army lowered design standards for the permanent highway, directing the Public Roads Administration to follow the early truck trail as much as possible in order to expedite completion of the year-round all-weather road. The PRA spent much of the winter of 42 on preparations for the next season's construction by repairing equipment and building shops and camps. Rest camps were established along the road to house truck drivers, road maintenance crews, and to service and repair equipment. The steady stream of supplies was only halted when temporary bridges were carried away by ice or when heavy rains caused embankments to give way, causing landslides that blocked the road. With the coming of warm weather, long stretches of the Pioneer Road became impassable. Traffic would back up for miles. Trucks would jam up when the muskeg melted and the ground became a deep rutted gumbo mud. Permanently frozen ground became a bottomless quagmire when exposed to sun and air. The ever-present cats had to pull the vehicles through and get the traffic moving again. Logs often had to be placed in a corrugated fashion to form a foundation for the trucks to drive over. Washouts were a major problem. The first bridges built by the Corps of Engineers were temporary log bridges of untreated timber. Heavy rains on July 9th and 10th, 1943 destroyed 24 bridges and closed the Fort Nelson section of the road for 40 days. At the beginning of World War II, less than 3% of the armed forces were black soldiers. The military had a policy at the time that used Negroes mostly as service troops. There existed an attitude that black soldiers could not perform the complex jobs that the modern military required. 
black soldiers working on the road would prove this attitude wrong. Of the more than 10,000 troops working on the highway, 3,600 were black. The three black regiments served with distinction, receiving meritorious unit commendations. They built not only the highway, but acceptance for all blacks in the military. With the pullout of the Army engineers in July of 43, it was now up to the Public Roads Administration to finish construction. Workers leveled and straightened the roadway and improved the drainage system. The best parts of the Pioneer Road were saved and incorporated into the final highway. The worst parts lasted long enough to serve their purpose and were replaced. At the peak of operations, 81 contractors had 14,000 men working on the highway from Dawson Creek to Big Delta. Most of the contractors worked two 11-hour shifts a day, seven days a week. Hourly pay rates ran from 96 cents for laborers to $2 for shovel, dragline, and crane operators. Truck drivers were paid from $1.10 to $1.40 an hour. Women played an important support role in the building of the highway. They worked as cooks, clerks, secretaries, nurses, and some even drove trucks. Wherever they went along the road, they brought smiles and memories of home to the men. Another milestone occurred in early August of 1943 with the opening of the Peace River Bridge, located about 50 miles northwest of Dawson Creek. Reconstruction of the Pioneer Road to a permanent all-weather road was completed October 13, 1943, with the reopening of a 40-mile section near the Alaska-Yukon border by the Utah Construction Company. The building of the highway not only changed the land of the Northwest, but would have a lasting impact on its native people. The military and civilian workers brought different lifestyles and values to the area. The soldiers and civilians unknowingly brought sickness. The Yukon Indians had no immunities to diseases like German measles, mumps, and influenza. Serious epidemics caused many deaths in villages along the new road. The road also brought education, easier travel between villages, and made health care more accessible to the people of the Northwest. The end of the war brought great changes to the highway. In compliance with the agreement signed in 1942, the United States was to turn over the Canadian portion of the road six months after the war ended. On the 1st of April, 1946, control of 1,200 miles from Dawson Creek to the Alaska border passed to the Royal Canadian Army. Headquarters for the newly established Northwest Highway System was in Whitehorse. The new Northwest Highway System was primarily a military route. The Canadian Army was assigned the task of maintaining the highway. Rough spots, washouts, and dust everywhere continued being major barriers in keeping the highway open. When the Canadians took over the road, they knew that they were committed to endless repairs and revisions. 
and would have to replace many of the earlier wooden bridges and culverts. During the war and for the first few years afterward, the road was closed to most civilian travel for lack of most of the regular highway facilities. The only way a civilian was allowed on this military highway was by permit. Any civilian who wanted to travel the road had to get clearance from the military authorities in Dawson Creek before venturing up the Alcan. The Alaska Highway lies along some of the most beautiful yet forbidding country in the world. There were few gas stations, motels, or roadside cafes. People who did travel the road traveled through the kindness of those who lived along the way. The highway was finally open to civilian traffic in 1947. The road was gravel almost the entire length. It could be driven comfortably at 45 miles per hour. There were some bumpy, rutted, and hilly stretches calling for speeds of 25 to 30 miles per hour. A woman driving up the highway wrote a friend that signs were scarce along the road, but when you did come on one, you had better believe it. In 1949, William Wallace, seeing there was a need for civilians using the Alaska Highway to know what services were available, published The Mile Post. The name Mile Post comes from the familiar white mile posts which give the number of miles from mile zero at Dawson Creek, British Columbia. The Mile Post is an annual guidebook with useful information about services and accommodations offered along the road a large fold-out map, mileage tables, and more. Now in its 44th edition, Milepost has become a popular reference for residents and tourists alike. By early 1950, the highway had emerged as an important commercial supply line. Highway traffic continued to increase with the flow of goods and materials moving north into the Yukon and Alaska. An old trucker was heard to say, I get a new thrill out of every mile of this old highway, every trip I make. At noon on October 16, 1957, girders of the Peace River Bridge failed, and a 600-foot span fell into the river. Traffic along the Alaska Highway had to be rerouted to use a railroad bridge three miles upriver. The new Peace River Bridge was opened in January of 1960 to traffic. On April 1, 1964, nearly 22 years after opening the Pioneer Road, the Department of National Defense transferred responsibility for the highway to Public Works of Canada. Civilian traffic had greatly increased between 1946 and 1964. With increased traffic came demands for reconstruction and paving. There were calls for feasibility studies on highway redevelopment and endless political debates on both sides of the border about spending large sums of money on a small population spread across vast distances and contributing only limited funds. In 1967, local leaders in Whitehorse sponsored a 25-year Alaska Highway anniversary celebration. Speakers called for paving the highway, arguing that a paved road would increase tourist travel, improve the flow of freight, and be an overall benefit to the people of the North. Public criticism escalated as the increasing number of trucks and campers accelerated deterioration of the highway. The government wanted to put responsibility of the highway into the hands of the provincial government. The provincial government was not willing to accept the increasing costs. 
By the late 1960s, some sections of the road were paved, some sections had a good gravel surface, while some sections were still dusty and substandard. Broken windshields and headlights were common, and in dry weather, dust clouds reduced visibility. Construction of the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline and the proposed construction of a gas pipeline parallel to the Alaska Highway would bring an increased number of cars and trucks traveling the outdated road. In 1973, the U.S. and Canada again opened negotiations for a cost-sharing program for paving the highway. In 1978, the U.S. and Canadian governments agreed to the upgrading and paving of the Canada section of the Haines Road to Haines Junction, and from there to the Alaska-Yukon border. The 1980s brought more and more cars, trucks, and RVs up the highway. Annually, more than 100,000 people were using the Alaska Highway for business and tourist travel. Time brings changes. With each year, a mile is straightened here, a curve is taken out there, and a little more of the original route is lost to progress. We end up bypassing parts of our past for the sake of convenience. Today, the Alcan is 1,422 miles in length from Dawson Creek, BC to Delta Junction, Alaska. The Canadian portion of the route measures 1,200 miles from Dawson Creek to the Alaska-Yukon border. The road is paved in most places. Less than 100 miles remained gravel as recently as 1991. It has been called one of the most remarkable construction feats in history built by thousands of soldiers and civilians, American and Canadian. Built as a result of the military need to connect the continental United States with Alaska. Donald McDonald said, a highway to Alaska must be built. Slim Williams proved it could be done. Thousands of men and women opened a road north. The vision became a reality. <laughs>
Production funding for the Alaska Highway is made possible by the Alaska Division of Tourism. Westmark Hotels, offering lodging, dining, and northern hospitality throughout Alaska and the Yukon. Gray Line of Alaska. The Anchorage Times, locally owned and operated since 1915.